All right. Um, so yeah, I I just wanted to start off with that um, with that that uh, moment of um, you know just kind of, just kind of honoring the, those uh, 251 children and and the lives lost. Um, it's been hard for us all, um, but especially being Indigenous, these findings are inherently traumatic and they bring out a lot of stuff. Um, if you have anyone in your network, coworkers, friends, family, loved ones that are Indigenous, I, I recommend you reach out to them and, and just let them know that uh, you're there for them and uh, that you know, you're available to speak to them if needed. Um, Indigenous peoples that live away from their traditional communities often do not have the same access to support that a lot of other folks have. Um, so this group of people are especially vulnerable during these times. Um, I belong to this group personally, and I had a couple of people reach out to me over this past week after allowing me an opportunity to mourn. Um, and it, it really just meant a lot, just knowing that there are, there are people there for you. Um, it's a it's a huge thing. So I really, you know, I, I encourage you to to kind of reach out um, if you if you know any indigenous people within your network um, and just yeah, lend a helping hand. Um, we're respectful and and um, we're available. So um, on that note, uh, I would just like to thank everyone for for joining us today on uh, BC Trail today uh, to listen to this presentation hosted by the Trail Society of British Columbia. And uh, today I will be talking about decolonization, indigenous rights, and trails. Um, I will start by giving a historical background regarding dispossession in BC. I will then go over some legal terms, then speak on decolonization, give a brief definition of what the decolonization means, um, and then we'll move forth towards looking at different case studies of trails uh, that are enacting decolonization and why these are important. I will then finish off by looking at the importance of Indigenous engagement in enacting decolonization. At the end of the presentation, we will have an open question and answer period where you can turn on your video, turn on your mics and, and ask questions in, um, in your own words, or if you'd prefer, you can also ask them via the chat function. But if you would like to ask questions um, just using the chat function throughout the presentation, uh, I will try to answer some um, I'm not definitely not going to get to all of them, but it might be a good way to, you know, write down a question and then um, if I don't address it, then at the very end of the presentation, you know, you can just look back through the chat and uh, and find your question and then ask it to me then. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, just thought I'd let everyone know about that. Um, and uh, finally, before before we begin, I'd just like to thank the Outdoor Recreation Council for funding this event. Um, this event is partially paid for by the BC Trails Day microgrant uh, provided by the Outdoor Recreation Council. Uh, today, June 5th, is BC Trails Day, and the Outdoor Recreation Council of BC has funded many different community events throughout the province, um, both today and over the next couple of weeks. So I recommend going over to their website and check under the BC Trails Day tab um, to look at events that uh, could possibly be happening in your community. So. Um, yeah, I, I really recommend doing that and it would really help them out and help out, you know, organizations such as ours that are hosting these events. Uh, I would also like to thank the Vancouver Foundation and the Real Estate Foundation of British Columbia for funding the Greenways for All research and for making it so that our organization is able to host events like these. It's huge. So thanks again to the Van Foundation and the Real Estate Foundation. All right. So getting into it. Um, so the history of dispossession in BC. Um, this is a, a, a very loaded topic. Uh, I wanted to just kind of look over some of the beginning points in history um, where colonization really took shape in, in the province. So Douglas treaties was um, some of the first treaties that were signed. They were the first treaties that were signed in, in British Columbia. And it was conducted by Governor James Douglas from 1850 to 1854. Uh, they were illegal in nature, they were done with military force, and after signing the agreements, um, they would often put in clauses uh, that were never formally agreed upon. And in 1859, Governor James Douglas issued a proclamation stating that all lands in British Columbia belong to the Crown. And uh, the Joint Indian Reserve Commission uh, operated from 1876 to 1878. It intended to establish reserves in British Columbia. 
Uh, treaties existed throughout Canada, but not very many existed in BC. Uh, and commissioners did not believe that Indigenous peoples had a rightful claim to the land. And, and part of that is uh, as a result of the proclamation that Governor James Douglas issued. Um, and another really important thing is that reserves were established without prior and informed consent. Um, so this is, again, just a, a quite a loaded topic. And I just want to talk a little bit about the history of dispossession to provide some context. So the date of the Joint Indian Reserve Commission is really important. Uh, BC joined Confederation in 1871 with the promise that a railway would be created to link Eastern and Western Canada. And this commission um, believed that, you know, Indigenous peoples didn't have a rightful claim to their land. Um, so reserves were established in order to take Indigenous peoples off their lands, uh, remove them from the land without their consent. And this was done so the government of Canada could make decisions pertaining to the extraction and mobilization of resources, as well as decisions such as the establishment of the Canadian Pacific Railway without Indigenous peoples uh, interfering with such decisions. All right, so uh, why is this important? Um, well, this is important because uh, no lands were officially ceded. Uh, with the, the Douglas treaties, they have, some of them have been renegotiated in the, in the modern day, but still 95% of British Columbia remains unceded, and this is distinct to British Columbia. I, I'm not trying to say that uh, all treaties are bad and that un, unceded lands are better. That's not the point that I'm trying to make. I just wanna point out this distinct relationship that the Crown has with Indigenous nations throughout the province of BC. And I also just wanna point out uh, some of the legal distinctions that go along with unceded lands. So uh, some of these legal distinctions. Um, so we have self-determination, free prior and informed consent and sovereignty. So self-determination is, it means that Indigenous peoples have the inherent right to self-determination uh, meaning that as the original owners of the land, their rights are directly tied to the land and more specifically relating to the land and the water. Free prior and informed consent pertains to the, to the decision making process and decisions must be made in conjunction with the indigenous nations who lay claim to the land and they must give their permission for any activities that take place on their land. Sovereignty is the full right and power of a governing body over itself without any interference from outside sources or bodies. So indigenous nations and their relationships to the land, which is a large component of their sovereignty, predates relationships with the crown. Indigenous peoples are sovereign peoples inherently. This is the same sovereignty that the constitution of the nation state of Canada has with the crown. Indigenous peoples have inherent rights to self-determination. Self-determination, meaning many things of focus, is the right to control territory and decisions that affect them and their traditional lands. If you would like to learn more about sovereignty and sovereign relationships, I encourage you to look up what the definition is um, for a sovereign body. Self-determination refers to relationships with the land and the water and who controls the decision-making process. This essentially encapsulates the fact that Indigenous peoples have control over their own lives and what happens within their own lands. In November of 2019, the BC government passed Bill 41, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act, which is otherwise known as DRIPA. Uh, this was adopted from the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, otherwise known as UNDRIP. DRIPA includes all of these listed terms, self-determination, free prior and informed consent, and sovereignty. And what this does is it dramatically alters the nature of consultation and engagement with Indigenous peoples in BC. The provincial government is currently in the process of establ establishing formalized action plans that are associated to uh, this new approach and to mandate the application of this new approach. All righty. So uh, moving on, what does this have to do with trails? Well, it has a lot to do with trails. Um, there's the historical trauma of dispossession. There's the modern day context in relation to trails and, and moving forward, how we reach you know, decolonization and reconciliation. So uh, when we as an organization engage with an indigenous nation and speak about matters such as rail trails, there are, there's historical trauma that is linked to these endeavors. This comes from the notion that Railways were established without free prior and informed consent, 
and it brought with it settlers to the region and residential schools, resource extraction, drugs, alcohol, disease. All of these issues are intertwined within railways, thus rail trails as well. In some instances with specific indigenous nations, there are stories linked to railways, which are reflective of the journeys children would have to make when attending or escaping residential schools. These are inherently traumatic events, which continue to echo throughout indigenous nations, communities, and peoples that were affected by this. All right, um, trails and indigenous peoples in BC. So um, on one side, we have indigenous trails that uh, have been in use since time immemorial. And on the other side is settler trails uh, that are historical trails that were put in place during the early onset of colonization. Excuse me. So um, indigenous trails have, again, been in use since time immemorial. Uh, we're used for hunting, fishing, gathering, trading, moving from region to region, and continue to be used for those same reasons, and are a way to explain traditional ecological knowledge as well as traditional knowledge systems. Uh, settler trails, such as Gold Rush trails from the Fraser River, South Okanagan, Big Bend, the Hudson Bay Company trails, the fur trails, wagon trails, horse trails, these were all utilized in order to advance colonization. The distinction being made here is that trails have different uses depending on, on the group of people using them. For Indigenous peoples, trails were utilized in order to gather important and culturally relevant resources and for purposes relating to stewardship of their territories and for moving from region to region. It is also a key component in terms of teaching and understanding traditional ecological knowledge systems as well as traditional knowledge systems. Whereas settler trails are indicative of resource extraction and mobilization, such as the gold rush, early wagon trails for settlers to travel from region to region, and of course, horse trails as well. Trails were historically utilized by settlers in order to advance colonization. The point that I'm trying to make here is that trails are used for different reasons, even in the modern day. If you look at why settler descendant peoples use trails versus the indigenous perspective of trails and what they represent, we really need to reframe our perspective of trails in order to advance decolonization. Now, to make trails that don't solely work for settler descendant peoples, but to make trails that work for indigenous peoples um, is a, it's a crucial piece. And when an organization approaches an indigenous nation with a trail plan, with the intent of establishing a trail within their land, the first question is, who is this for? And what does this trail mean for us? There needs to be um, a, an approach that doesn't fixate on that, uh, where, you know, some, person or an organization or some stakeholder of some form approaches an indigenous nation with a desired um, trail plan. We need to stray away from that approach entirely because this is the same mentality that settlers had when they created trails during the early onset of colonization for the purposes of colonization. This is a key component in redefining what trails mean from both an organizational perspective and from an indigenous perspective. So uh, recreation and tourism, um, what does this mean from an Indigenous perspective? Uh, so this is historically a settler descendant endeavor. Um, there's not a whole lot of room for Indigenous participation or perspectives. There's the example of Silver Star Resort, which I'll get to in a moment. Uh, indigenous lands being used as a playground for settler descendant peoples and the need for reframing this lens of tourism and trails in order to advance decolonization and reconciliation. Recreation and tourism has been a historically settler descendant endeavor. The Silver Star Resort here in Vernon, about an hour away from me, is a prime example of that. Where Silver Star is located, the mountain has a spiritual and cultural significance to it from a Silk or Okanagan perspective. This is a traditional region to gather uh, Saskatoon berries, and it's also a place of ceremony. Since time immemorial, communities would move to this area in the summer and gather and pray. But in the modern day, this region has been encapsulated by the tourist sector. Silver Star Resort was initially established in, in 1957 and 1958, and this was done without the prior informed consent of the Silk Nation. 
Since then, it has flourished as a world-renowned resort destination. In 2002, Silver Star Resort signed a memorandum of understanding with the Okanagan Nation. But even upon researching this topic, there's really not a whole lot of information about it. When you go to Silver Star, the resort has a small land acknowledgement situated at the entrance of the resort. Uh, <clears throat> when you go in through um, kind of the first you know, when you're walking through the pathways, there's a huge, you know, map outlining different areas, different, you know, different skis, snowboard hills, and the levels, um, and then, you know, snowshoeing, and uh, there's that huge map, and then on kind of the bottom right, there's a, a little plaque that says, you know, uh, has a brief land acknowledgement uh, dedicated to the seal, and um, yeah, the, the main point that I'm trying to make is that this was done without prior and informed consent, uh, the revenue generated from this resort does not funnel back into the Seal Nation or the uh, Splatson, who also acknowledges this area as a shared territory with the Seal. Um, this tourist and recreation endeavor continues to generate millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of revenue on an annual basis, but is also representative of the ongoing colonization that is perpetuated by tourist ventures. Tourism and recreation sectors in BC mean for Indigenous peoples that their land will be used by settler descendant peoples as a playground. This means that the land will not be respected for its intended purpose, and the Indigenous nations that are the original inhabitants of these lands will not have their inherent rights to self-determination and their sovereign rights acknowledged or respected. From an organizational standpoint, if your organization belongs to the tourist or outdoor recreation sector, then you are a participator in this continued act of colonization. And we must work towards reframing this relationship in order to advance decolonization and reconciliation. All right, that was a lot. I'll see if there's any uh, questions now. All right, looks like um, there is not any questions, so. I will continue. Um, so what is decolonization? Uh, so I, I really like this, this definition. It is, it is brief and it is quite broad, but um, decolonization is a process which engages with imperialism and colonialism at multiple levels. And this is from Dr. Linda Tuolui Smith, who is a, a Maori scholar. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, again, it, it is a broad, um, definition, but you know, there's that key piece where de decolonization it depends on engaging with imperialism and colonialism. And so, now what what does this look like in practice? So historically, if we look back at, in the to the era of decolonization um, that happened following the Second World War, countries in Asia and Africa were ridding their nations of colonial powers to establish their independence. In essence, this is a similar process. Understanding how imperialism and colonialism impact our lives is an important first step um, towards decolonization. This can be as simple as understanding the reason why we wake up uh, to our alarm clocks, dress in a formal manner, then commute to work. This process is colonial in nature. We feel rushed, we have time constraints, and we need to make money and transport, our, transport ourselves to and from our workplace. This process is inherently stressful, yet it is ingrained in us. It's second nature. So we normalize this process and see it as a necessity. Meanwhile, think about all the ways that imperialism and colonialism have impacted the land and our minds in order for this process to occur. Think about the materials that were extracted and fabricated to create your alarm clock, your clothes, your vehicle, the roads. Think about how the natural ecosystem was torn apart to establish the roads, the trees that were cut down, the culverts that were created and how this impacts our waterways. Now think about the people that made these decisions from the early onset of colonization to the modern day. What did these people look like? What was their background? Who was left out of this process? This is decolonization in practice. It is understanding all of the facets of our day-to-day -day life and how we continue to be impacted by colonization and how we can work towards remedying this. Uh, in one of my indigenous studies classes, this one professor that I had, um, he used to have a, a red sunglasses lens and he used to always pull it out and look through it. 
um, on the first day of class to ingrain this mentality within the students. You have to look through everything within that red lens, um, that indigenous lens to understand how we can work towards decolonization. All right, uh, moving on, how do we decolonize trails? Um, so there's definitely no one size fits all equation. Um, each you know, indigenous person, uh, each indigenous nation, uh, they're, they're all gonna have, everyone's gonna have a different response to this. Uh, each community even will have a different response to this question. What matters is that whether you're a member of the government, a local organization or a larger nonprofit, we need to bring members from indigenous communities to the decision-making table and listen to their insight throughout the design, establishment, and post-trail establishment process and constantly tailor plans so that they work for the community. Uh, the Outdoor Recreation Council released a guide in collaboration with Patrick Lucas called uh, Working in a Good Way. And it is a great guide for engaging and working with Indigenous peoples on outdoor recreation and trail projects throughout the province. This is a great first step and resource for understanding how to appropriately navigate this relationship. Uh, the second piece here, the need for uh, Indigenous languages, contemporary and historical relationships to the land and traditional knowledge systems to be, to be embedded within trail projects. This is crucial for understanding how we work to decolonize the outdoor recreation sector. If you travel throughout British Columbia, you can find numerous examples of pioneer or settler histories being highlighted through trails. They will often be accompanied by facilitated guided tours. And it is a great way for tourists to explore different areas and to learn one side of the history of these lands. In regards to indigenous led and facilitated tours and indigenous languages and plaques and interpretive signage that highlight contemporary and historical relationships to the land, these are much more difficult to find throughout our province. But there are some, and I will highlight them and how this is decolonizing trails in practice. I would also just like to point out the importance of contemporary relationships to the land. Indigenous peoples continue to maintain principles of stewardship and maintain relationships to their land and water. It is based on traditional oral narratives, but is a continued and a contemporary process. Um, it's not lost, it's, it's something that continues to occur and continues to be taught. Um, this is a really great table, um, and this is pulled from the Indigenous Peoples Community Land Use Planning Handbook in BC. And uh, yeah, this just, just helps understand how multifaceted the contemporary relationship and contemporary understandings of relationships to the land are. So there's, you know, physical relationships, mental, intellectual, social and emotional, and cultural and spiritual. And then at the top, we have nation, region, community that goes all the way around, uh, nation and community, clan and family, individual, and then the land in the center. So I'll just give everyone a couple moments to kind of uh, read through that. I, uh, I see a question here. Um, what can recreational users do when using these sites to reduce harm or try to avoid? So uh, yeah, that's something that I'm, I'm gonna address uh, a little bit from now. So um, yeah, we can just do that. Uh, you'll you'll hear, hear me talk about it uh, in, in a little bit, so. All right. Um, hopefully everyone had a chance to just kind of look through and, and just see how all encompassing um, the, the understanding of relationships to the land is. And <clears throat> the point that I'm trying to make here is that uh, there's a lot that you have to keep in mind in regard to understanding contemporary indigenous relationships to the land. Part of the decolonization process is understanding the needs of indigenous peoples and nations. 
The understanding of relationships to the land is intertwined within this. In order to decolonize the land, there is a need to incorporate Indigenous nations and their perspectives of the land in order to engage with Indigenous nations in a meaningful way. This means shedding uh, colonial preconceptions and beliefs and ideologies of the land to understand Indigenous perspectives. There's a need to shift towards looking at different trail projects that are premised on Indigenous cultures, values, and beliefs, thereby making them decolonial in nature. And so uh, we're going to do that right now. <clears throat> so uh, to start off, uh, this is the Siyuk Chowluk um, Adventure Park. Uh, it's this is in the uh, Halkawalem uh, language. And uh, let's just watch a short video um, regarding this. So yeah, that was just a just a, a brief video kind of looking at um, the uh, Siyuk Chaluk uh, Adventure Park. Um, the the uh, interpretation for that name, uh, what that name means is Rockside in the forest, and it's referring to the area um, and, you know, what it looks like following the Hope Slide. So um, as you could see from that video, uh, it's, it's beautiful, and there's a lot that kind of went into that. Um, this project was established in collaboration with First Journey Trails and the Squahaluk uh, First Nation. And this project was made through direct collaboration with the community, their leadership and community members. Um, they had local artists, uh, local indigenous artists from the Haida Nation and the Stahalis Nation uh, that helped create some of the carvings and other art forms that is viewable throughout the park. Um, again, you know, you saw the signage from the start there. It's in the Halk Hulk, uh language. And uh, this park attracts members from uh, local bands, families, uh, both non-Indigenous and Indigenous to come enjoy what the Squahaluk uh, First Nation created uh, with this adventure park. In total, uh, there's about uh, five and a half kilometers of mixed use trails. And then uh, you could also see there's that massive playground space as well. All right, uh, moving on. Uh, so uh, another good example of kind of decolonized trails is uh, the Incomeet Desert Cultural Center. Um, they have a an outdoor, uh, it's around a two kilometer loop. Um, and it's, yeah, it's it's this beautiful, desert trail as a component of their cultural center where they, they offer uh, guided tours and they teach visitors about the traditional plants, how they were used, the history of the region, um, traditional architecture. They, they have pit houses, um, as you can see with this image. Um, so yeah, they, they take you to you know, some of these pit houses and they go over some of the traditional architecture, why they were made like this, um, who they were made for, um, here's just a, a picture of the, the trail itself. Um, you can see it's, you know, just a pathway and it's going, you know, through the, through the middle of, of, uh, you know, the outdoors and, you know, a lot of untamed brush and, and stuff like that. And, you know, they teach a lot about the, the vegetation and, um, again, just kind of the traditional ecological knowledge, traditional usages for the plants and, and medicine. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, it's a really good one. I really, 
uh, encourage you to um, to go to go to the Inkme Desert Cultural Center in Asoyuz. Um, it's all owned and operated by the Asoyuz Indian Band. Uh, I've been, I think, three times in total now, um, and every time I, I seem to learn something new. So uh, it's a it's a really good one. Um, and then uh, another uh, really good one. It's not so much based in uh, in BC, but it's in uh, Port Townsend, Washington, and it's called the uh, Cheech Mahan Trail. Um, and I'll just show you. So here is um, just a plaque from the, the Cheech Mahan Trail. And uh, yeah, there's, there's all these uh, interpretive signs throughout the park. Um, they're really well done. Um, you can even see on the bottom left, there's a interpretive, or there's a QR code um, where you can go and uh, you can learn more. Uh, you scan the QR code. Everyone's got a mobile device on them now. You just use a little data, scan the QR code, and you can learn more about uh, Chief Cheech Mahan um, and the Sklalem Nation. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I just love this idea. This is one of my favorite examples. Um, and then, yeah, you can see, you know, this is some of their traditional artwork. Um, just beautiful. Uh, it's really well done. I, I love love this example. Um, so I got to see how to get out of here. I got one more thing to show you from here. Oops. Well, that works. All right. So I just want to show you how, how big the scale of this is. Um, so yeah, th this is kind of the intention of, um, uh, for creating this. So, um, you know, you're walking in the, in the footsteps of the Sklalem leader, uh, Chief Cheech Mahan. Um, and you can see there's, you know, lots of the different points on this map are, are named after, are, are named in their traditional language. So, yeah, um, it starts, you know, kind of down here in the middle of town and uh, goes all the way across town. Um, all the way to the top. And it, yeah, it's uh, another interesting thing from this is that um, this was created uh, in collaboration with the Unitarian Universalist Church. Um, and they helped kind of jumpstart this project to engage with and learn from the original inhabitants of the land um, where their fellow fellowships uh, now call home. And uh, so yeah, it was the Unitarian Universalist Church um, from the um, from Port Townsend, and then uh, the Jamestown Scalum uh, Nation, and uh, the municipality of Port Townsend that all you know worked in collaboration to to make this project happen. And it's yeah, it's just a, a really great example of decolonizing trails and practice. You you have you know all these different interpretive plaques. Um, locals, tourists can go. Um, kind of throughout the town and and learn about this important um, figure for the Sklalem, um Chief Cheech Mahan. And uh, yeah, the, the trail is comprised of 18 sites um, throughout the city of Port Townsend. And uh, the, they naturally divide into a three mile, a six mile or a 12 mile loop. So there's you know, quite a lot to, to see. Um, and uh, this is just a quote um, regarding the, the Cheech Mahan Trail. So in many ways, what we know about Cheech Mahan's life represents the difficulties encountered across the country in the struggle for peaceful coexistence between American Indians and non-Native peoples who found themselves living in the same geographical area with very different cultural values. So yeah, it's just a, it's just a really good um, example and, and one that I, um, I, I thought a lot about uh, throughout my Greenways for All research, um, and I wrote about it. And again, it's just a, another great case study of decolonizing trails in practice, what that looks like. And I, I find it really interesting that it was done in collaboration with the church. Um, and they, you know, helped jumpstart the project because they wanted to learn more about the, you know, the J Jamestown Sklalem. And uh, yeah, they helped jumpstart the project and, and make this you know, uh, come into fruition. So just really well done all together. Um, 
And uh, finally, I just have some some other uh, trails that I'd like to mention that, again, is just decolonial de in, in nature. So first, we have the Nukfalk uh, Carrier Grease Trail. Um, so here's just an example of, of one of their interpretive signs. And then here's the trail itself, which you can see is, you know, you can see it way far in the distance um, going all throughout. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting one. Oops. Um, and uh, this is uh, just from um, their website. So the trail is a, a vital corridor of exchange. It has been for over 6,000 years from when Ulichon, Greece, dripped from the boxes carried by First Nations traders. So Ulichon, Greece um, is otherwise known as um, candlefish. Some people might know it as that. Um, and it's a, an important resource for it that has the cultural um, and also uh, mercantile kind of attachments to it. So um, the Ulichon Greece stains the trail route um, and to today uh, communities continue to use the trail to connect each other uh, and to the land from the interior to the Pacific coast. Um, the Nukthalt Carrier uh, Greece Trail has been host to many travelers. It is their histories and stories that make the trail such a vital feature. The route traverses history. It tells the stories of ancestors, of animals, of families, landscapes, culture, and practice. Um, so yeah, it's a 420 kilometer trail um, that is just completely, again, just, you know, it's, it's etched out in the natural landscape um, through this, this traditional trade route um, that's been in use for, for over 6,000 years. So it's a, it's a really good example. Um, the nation has kind of, you know, they they were the ones to jumpstart this project and to create the interpretive signage and to kind of bring attention to it and to protect it as well, um, to, you know, continue, uh, you know, telling that story um, and to, to keep this route protected um, is huge. So again, just another example of decolonization of practice. So here is um, kind of the last example that I have to share, and it's uh, a part of the TCT, it's the Chief Isidore Trail.
So yeah, quick uh, quick shout out to Trails BC for helping put um, Trails BC uh, volunteers and then also the TCT for helping establish this um, trail and, and uh, active transportation corridor um, from Cranbrook to Wardner. Um, it's named after a Tanaha chief, um, Chief Isidore, and it, it features signage in the Tanaha language as well as interpretive signs regarding the history of Chief Isidore and the Tanaha Nation. So here's just some examples of that. So this would be on the trail and it says, uh, welcome to Tanaha territory. And it you know, talks a little bit about who they are. Um, and then here's just an example of, again, you know, in their language, um, welcome to their territory and, and talks a little bit about, about their, their nation. So um, it's really well done, um, even in the, the uh, kind of sponsors like who created this trail. There's um, the Trans Canada Trail, the Tanaha Nation, and Rex Heights and Trails BC. So they're all kind of recognized together. And the Tanaha Nation um, obviously was, you know, a huge part of that collaboration. So <clears throat> um, the point that I'm trying to make by uh, showing off some of these trails is that, um, you know, there there are some great examples of this happening, of decolonization and practice happening. Um, within trails in BC and that one great example based out of Washington State. Um, but it's much easier to find examples of pioneer histories uh, than it is Indigenous contemporary and historical knowledge uh, embedded within trails and active transportation uh, pathways. Um, there's a need for Indigenous perspectives and traditional knowledge systems to be represented within trails uh, throughout the province in a manner that is culturally respectful and appropriate. All of the trails that I listed um, were either owned and operated by or made in collaboration with uh, participating Indigenous nations. And this uh, infrastructure um, was created you know, directly through collaboration, uh, the artwork, the, the plaques, the interpretive signs, and the language. Um, were all established through engagement and feedback from uh, participating nations. So the huge point. Um, and uh, here's another really good table um, that I that I like. Um, again, coming from the Indigenous Peoples Community Land Use Planning Handbook in BC. Um, and this was uh, partially, um, this was funded by um, the Real Estate Foundation of BC. And so, um, as you can see, you know, the, the principles of engagement or the engagement principles, there's a lot that goes into it, um, respecting culture, um, elevating and sharing community-based uh, knowledge, building and strengthening networks, uh, sharing, discussing findings, working together, mutual recognition, uh, diverse participation, collaborative design, asking permission, um, this is, this is huge. And I, I, again, I just kind of, I really like this table. Um, what, what this table really highlights is that uh, this is a, a far more engaged process um, than the traditional engagement process outlined in uh, our current consultation um, process, uh, the consultation process for BC and the legislation that pertains to it. Uh, this list of engagement principles can, assist in understanding how thorough this process needs to be. Again, this, this goes above and beyond uh, what is outlined within the current legislation surrounding consultation. And it involves concepts that are founded on indigenous government governance protocol, traditional knowledge systems, involving the whole community, getting consistent and constant feedback and having shared decision-making. This really strays away from those hierarchical models which in, which in essence is the current model of consultation. It's a checkbox relationship facilitated by the Crown. Whereas these principles of engagement require much more work and facilitation in order to appropriately engage with indigenous peoples, communities, and nations. We need to decolonize the current consultation procedures to move towards this level of engagement. This is what decolonization looks like and how we work towards decolonizing trails and the outdoor recreation space. Indigenous peoples are the fastest growing population demographic in our country. I was born in 1996, the same year that the last residential school closed. 
I would like to be a part of this process where I can to help educate and work towards decolonizing this process. This was a large component of the work that we were doing with the Greenways for All research and the work that we continue to do. And it continues to be a huge focal point of what I am working on with the Trail Society of BC. I feel privileged to take up this space and offer my voice. And I would just like to thank um, our, our president, the president of Trails BC, CL Sander, uh, my research supervisor, Tara Howes, uh, Richard Campbell, who I continue to work with to develop uh, future projects and, and find different grants and funding sources to continue doing this work. And all of our wonderful board of directors that have um, provided their insight into this process and have accepted and taken constructive criticism as a means to decolonize our organization and to work towards decolonizing trails throughout the province. This work wouldn't be possible without accepting the fact that there are a lot of areas um, that we could be doing things better. And within this organization, we acknowledge this and we have been working to fix the many issues that are there in BC. I really encourage you to get involved and to help do the same, whether it be at a governmental, organizational, or even an individual level. There's a lot of work that needs to be done, but don't feel disheartened. We all have to start somewhere. I'm still in the process of decolonizing myself even. Um, it's a, again, it's, it's a continued process um, and it's an ongoing process. Colonization is a continued process and an ongoing process. And we have to recognize that and that's a first step. And moving forward, it's, it's fixated on a lot of principles of just getting educated on the topic. Um, and a good place to start to get educated on the topic are some fabulous Indigenous authors and academics. Um, here are some really great sources if you're interested. Uh, these scholars are all Indigenous and represent different areas of expertise. Um, I'm asked all the time for my insight on different Indigenous issues, um, uh, but I don't have all the answers. And there's a lot of information that has already been done and it can be as easy as going to your local library to find indigenous academics that have already done this work. Um, so starting off from the beginning, um, Pamela Palmutter, um, she is one of my idols. Uh, she's Mi'kmaq and uh, she has a strong background in law. I believe she was a practicing lawyer and now she is a law professor at Ryerson. Um, she writes a lot about uh, traditional forms of governance, traditional laws, Mi'kmaq laws, Mi'kmaq government, governance. Um, and also she writes a lot about uh, and talks a lot about, um, you know, different laws that we need to change to work towards uh, reconciliation and, and laws that continue to infringe our rights um, as Indigenous people and, and other marginalized folks. So um, yeah, really good resource. Um, she has a strong uh, social media presence. So if you use uh, Instagram or, or Facebook or um, Twitter, uh, even TikTok, she's on TikTok. Um, and she's, she's great for um, kind of educating on a, oops, on a lot of different issues. Um, and uh, yeah, I'd really recommend kind of looking at, at some of the novels that she's published, um, some of the articles that she's published and uh, kind of going from there. Uh, Jeanette Armstrong, um, she is Silk, uh, Dr. Jeanette Armstrong, I should say. Uh, she's Silk, and she is a, a pivotal member of the Silk community. Um, she has a great novel um, called uh, We Get Our Living Like Milk from the Land, and it's a kind of a foundational understanding of um, traditional kind of societal organization and governance protocol for the Silk. Um, if you live in Okanagan, I, if you live in the Okanagan or you're interested in learning more about the Silk people, um, this book is a must have. Um, throughout my undergrad, uh, my undergrad was in, I majored in Indigenous Studies and I minored in History. Uh, this book was my lifeblood. Um, I used this book all throughout my undergrad. Uh, yeah, she, there's a lot of really good information in there. And yeah, I'd really, really recommend getting that. Um, Again, if you're if you're interested or if, if you live within the Seals territory, I'd say it's a must. Uh, Marilyn James, uh, she's a Sinaiix uh, matriarch. Um, she's also an academic. Um, the if you don't know much about the Sinaiix uh, 
Uh, they were declared extinct in BC in 1956, and the government of Canada um, officially recognizes that the, the Sinaiaks are um, extinct. I think there's current, there's current legal cases that are uh, going on that are challenging that. Um, but yeah, since 1956, they've been declared extinct. Um, Marilyn James is a uh, great proof that there are still Sinaiq people that live um, in uh, southeastern British Columbia in the Kootenays. And uh, yeah, she's a, a pivotal member of the Sinaiq community on the Canada side. Um, and uh, I'd really recommend just kind of looking at, at some of the publications that she has. Um, Next, uh, Linda Tuahui Smith. Um, she, a doctor, Linda Tuahui Smith. Um, she's a Maori academic and has a strong background in decolonization and what this looks like. The quote that I pulled out earlier, that was from uh, Linda Tuahui Smith. And yeah, uh, again, definitely another resource that I used all the time. Uh, she has this one novel called uh, Decolonizing Methodologies. And uh, yeah, it talks a lot about how imperialism and colonialism interact with our with our day-to-day -day lives, our day-to-day -day activities, and then also our minds um, and how we work towards, you know, approaching that. Um, and then also, you know, ways to decolonize the academy. Um, and yeah, uh, really good resource. Um, Dr. Greg Younging, uh, he recently passed away, but uh, he was the professor that I was speaking about earlier with the, the red lens, the red sunglasses lens. He's um, Cree. And uh, he wrote, he has like a lot of experience in publishing. He worked for this um, indigenous publishing company uh, called Thetis Publishing, which is based out of um, the Penticton Indian Band. Um, and even though he's, he's not from uh, Silk territory, uh, you know, he was accepted here and uh, worked quite heavily to establish Thetis as this uh, now, uh, within the landscape of Canada, it's kind of one of the preeminent uh, publishers um, and indigenous, indigenous publishers. Um, so, yeah, he has this uh, elements of Indigenous style, a guide for writing about and for Indigenous people. And so if you're a writer, um, whether, you know, or a reporter or any of those fields, or, or you just write about Indigenous people, um, this, this book is a must. Uh, it's a really great way for um, understanding, you know, uh, the do's and don'ts for for writing about and for Indigenous people. Um, and that was his his last publication, and it's it's a really good one. Um, I think it's yeah, it's Canada wide. Um, lots of different institutions use it um, and and have it as like part of their course materials. Um, and it's yeah, it's huge. Um, Dr. Margot Temez, uh, she is. Uh, Dene Nde, um, and she's a poet and historian that uh, her traditional territory is on the border. Uh, it's in South Texas along the Rio Grande. Um, and yeah, there's, you know, her, she's a, a border uh, people. That's the nation that she belongs to. It goes down into, you know, Northern Mexico and then within the, the Southern United States as well. Um, and the, you know, that's a highly militarized border. Um, and the, you know, the border wall, which is a huge thing, it goes right through her community. Um, and her and her mom have, you know, done quite a lot um, in terms of, you know, fighting that decision. And I, I believe it got all the way to the Supreme Court um, in the United States. But yeah, she, she's a poet and a historian and she writes a lot. She has a, like numerous publications. Um, and yeah, I really recommend um, if you're interested in any of that, um, or if you really like poetry, um, go go check out Margot Temez. Um, she implores a intersectional lens, a lot a heavy focus on critical race theory, um, and yeah, really interesting resource. Um, and Sylvia McAdam, uh, she's a Cree academic. Uh, she was one of the lead organizers for the Idle No More movement. I believe she only has two publications, but she has one um, that she did with the Saskatchewan uh, Cultural Center. So it's something like that. Um, and it's, it's just like a really straightforward kind of beginner's guide um, to understanding different protocol, um, indigenous protocol. And it's, 
it is from uh, kind of a Cree like um, understanding and, and way to approach it. Um, but I, I think there are a lot of ways to kind of implore similar models um, within British Columbia and, and wherever you live. So um, really good publication. Um, I have it like right near me, so I'll go, <laughs> I'll figure out the name of, of that book before, before we uh, end for the evening. Um, but yeah, uh, really good. Um, and yeah, Sylvia McAdam, I believe um, she do does have a, a background in law as well. Um, yeah, really, really good resource. So yeah, that, I know that took a really long time, but it's uh, really important. Um, if you are interested in learning more about these topics, these are just uh, some of a, a really long list of Indigenous academics that have a strong background in this sort of work. So um in closing so there's a huge amount amount of responsibility at the individual organizational and governmental levels uh we all have to set an example the burden is not solely on indigenous peoples to do this work we have to do our part in advancing reconciliation and decolonization we all have to acknowledge our participation in advancing decolonization in order to put an end to it whether you, you know, are an outdoor recreation enthusiast or you belong to an outdoor recreation or tourist organization, um, there you are a participant in advancing colonization and, you know, kind of going back, like just understanding the what decolonization means and, and how we work towards remedying that. It's, it's a long process, but, you know, that's why I pulled out that list of Indigenous academics. Um, you know, if you ever need to figure out like, okay, what am I doing wrong within my territory? Or, you know, how am I doing things improperly? You gotta go to your, um, go to Google, figure out uh, indigenous academics that are based out of your area um, and, and go find some publications that they've, they've, uh, they've wrote. Um, because yeah, there is uh, hundreds of thousands of indigenous academics throughout uh, the world. And they've, there's so much written about these sorts of topics. And uh, yeah, there's, there's got to be something within your own community, uh, wherever you reside, um, that a, an academic has, has written about. So I really um, kind of, you know, was, it would be awesome if, if you're interested in, in doing so. Um, yeah, go out and, and learn more about that. So progression starts with us as individuals, um, which can then echo throughout not only your organization, but also throughout other recreation and trail organizations um, and levels of government throughout BC. So there's a, a huge need to include Indigenous peoples, communities, and nations throughout the design, establishment, and post-trail establishment process. And we need to address the fact that we have been present and active participants of colonization. Colonization is an active process that continues to flourish throughout the nation state. We must address our role in order to advance decolonization and reconciliation. Uh, huge thanks again to the Outdoor Recreation Council of BC, uh, the Vancouver Foundation and the Real Estate Foundation of BC for funding this event. Uh, if you would like to ask any questions, feel free uh, to either use the chat function or if you're comfortable, you can turn on your video and audio and ask it in your own words. Um, yeah, whichever works. And thanks again, everyone. All right, you sure gave us a lot to think about. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, here we go. We've got a question, hands up from uh, Sal there. Hello, this is this question is for Seal. Uh, earlier in the presentation, uh, you mentioned that uh, you're looking to do something with uh, the referral process or or something in that aspect. You know, currently, you can easily do a referral process and then wait for the First Nations to come back. 
And uh, I've seen it where um, organizations have done that. And then because we, we've got overlapping uh, uh, First Nations interests in some of the areas all over throughout the province. And then one, one of the uh, First Nations communities will respond and then uh, partnerships are built. Um, is there any, anything happening in the government where through the uh, UNDRIP and reconciliation process that uh, will force organizations to uh, consult with all the nations, all the uh, communities? Okay, for some reason I got asked that question. Um, Damon, you were talking earlier about consultation. So I, I know for me, okay, I'm president of um, Trail Society of BC. And I, I think what um, Damon is, is thinking is um, to have us as, as trail organizations to reach out to um, the traditional territory holders of, of wherever we wanna place a, a trail or, you know, um, do signage or you know work on um, something on the traditional land that it's uh, the onerous should be on on us to go directly to that um, traditional landowner who you know I mean here in BC that we're here for at least ten thousand years if not more um, the 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 way the the government or the colonial process operates right now I think they do mandate. Um, uh, to send out notices to, um, you know, whoever the, the nations or bands are, uh, but not all of them, because <laughs> like, for instance, the BC government doesn't recognize the autonomous snakes, for instance. And then the, 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 um, I know like where I live, there's like a whole bunch of bands and people don't have the capacity to even answer back because they're just inundated with, um, you know, front counter BC requests. So um, it's not really working in a way that's, that's good necessarily for the people whose land it's, it's their traditional territory. That's just my opinion. Yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll give you an example. Uh, we, uh, Jeff Playfair is on the call and he's now the chair of the Bridger Valley Community Associates and Trail Committee. Back in eight or 2014, uh, we communicated with the Lillooet Tribal Council, which is the six northern uh, communities, of the, communities of the Statlium. And after four years, we had an MOU, Memorandum of Understanding. And, uh, and we, we were at the point of uh, six trails to legally establish them. We went through the process uh, of building a management plan, in terms of reference, um, all that stuff. But one of the issues that we came up with was exactly what you said, was the resources to uh, come to the meetings. And uh, currently now, um, there's an offer on the, it, it, it expired, it was only two years. It did expire and now um, I'm elected, I'm an elected official, so I've had to refrain from any of my volunteer work and uh, due to conflict of interest. And, and now the uh, Little Rock Tribal Council has come back with an amendment and, and actually have in that amendment, I've seen it, where the, uh, the lands manager for the LTC could be the only uh, representative on their side on the new four-year extension. So it's, 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 I just wanted to share that because uh, uh, we've also talked about signage and uh, um, the whole aspect of everything that was talked about today. We've been through that. All the cultural heritage studies are gonna be done on all the trails and, uh, and the list goes on. But it's the, the challenge is, is their resources that's held us back the most. Yeah, we need to um, create more equity so that um, that uh, you know people just aren't inundated with these requests. I think with COVID, there was some big complaints about that that happened, um, particularly around resource extraction. Um, so um, yeah, it's it's pretty rough. That's for sure. It's hard 
you know, it's, it's hard to get things done yeah. if you don't have resources. So good on you for, for working on it the way you have. I see Jeff's got his hand up. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, hi there. Um, following up uh, on Sal's comments, and I, I have been working with Sal on that, that project that he referenced uh, for the last six or six or eight years or whatever it is now. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, one of the one of the things that we've continually kind of wrapped around the table on is the idea of um, what what our our trail committee's intention was from the outset it was to get section 57s uh and and eventually section 56 status on the trails so that we could get funding to do maintenance and and do that on a shared basis with our our local first nation communities um and and one of the ideas that keeps uh, circling back from the tribal council is the idea that we don't register with the province we just simply uh register with them which is a nice idea but it doesn't meet the requirements for a lot of the funding uh stipulations on on uh, grants so i'm just uh, on that note i'm wondering do you have examples uh, elsewhere in british columbia where trails are are registered with first nations but not the province that are successful in getting funding Yeah, that's a that's a really good question. And uh, to be honest, off the top of my head, I don't. Um, but you know, I totally understand looking from it um, from the nation's perspective why they would feel more inclined to have that ownership attached to it rather than it being kind of signed over to the province. Um, so you know, looking at it from that scope, yeah, it definitely makes it more difficult to to secure funding, but. Um, if anything, that's more of the fault of the government for not really recognizing indigenous ownership of trails as a, you know, meaningful towards, um, you know, uh, the continued establishment of trails. Um, so, yeah, I, I could definitely do some research. If you want to give me your, um, your contact information, I can, I can follow up with you because, yeah, that's definitely not something I thought of, but um, something worth noting. And then we've done a lot of research in this area, and that's not something that came up. So be good to um you know for any future research or something to put that in there so yeah thank you so much yeah. and, and thank you and I'll, i will type my uh my contact information in the chat there um and, and although i i would maybe agree with you in principle that it's the fault of the government uh and they need to change their policy of course the reality is that that, that may not happen in my lifetime so yeah uh, you, you know, we're, we're sort of sitting on trying to get something moving forward in, a, in perhaps a shorter term um, and, uh, you know, waiting for the wheels of the provincial or the federal government to turn, uh, you know, might, might be a long wait. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's been, um, I know in the Okanagan Rail Trail did a lot of memorandum of understandings and there's some land swapping that's going on for all that completion and the Trans Canada Trail between Penticton and Summerland has never really been completed because of um, you know the, the the route of the KVR going through the Penticton Indian Band and um, so there, there's some land trading and um, you know I mean it's all about the land isn't it and uh, it's one thing to have you know uh, memorandum of understandings and that sort of thing but um yeah i think we need to return the land <laughs> so um yeah let's let's work towards that as a as a as a way of working with the province because you know i know that there's a big hiccup going on right now with that forced intentions policy that happened um this earlier this week with um what was announced about, you know, what the M Ministry of Forest Lands, Natural Resource Operations and Rural Development is going to be doing going ahead in terms of moving 10 years towards, um, you know, First Nations. And uh, there's some big questions about what that's really all about. It's um, so, yeah. <laughs> 
no easy answers. Yeah, thanks. Uh, when, oh, when, oh, go ahead, Leo. Wouldn't the uh, Chief uh, Isidore Trail be a, an example of this? The Chief Isidore? Yes. No, because it's uh, still under the um, it's still uh, under the purview of uh, the Ministry of Forests uh, under the partnership agreement of Rex Sites Trails BC. The, th the closest I could think of what's going on is with uh, what's happening with um, the the North Okanagan, uh, the Shushwap North Okanagan Rail Trail, where they've got um, mem memorandums with uh, the Enderby area there. I could put it up on the, if, oh, I guess I don't have good email right now, so it's not really working, but, um, you know, they've at least been able to incorporate a lot of uh, the leadership from uh, the indigenous First Nations of those territories. But they're not necessarily running the program <laughs> or they're not necessarily, you know, in charge. Yeah, the fact is that uh, uh, they, they don't have ownership of the of that trail, but uh, uh, I guess it's just permission given by uh, by the First Nations in this case, and allowing this to be a Section Fifty Six and so on. And I, I guess that's that's as close as we can we've have come to getting some sort of ownership to. The, to a trail, I think, in BC. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Looks like Sal has his uh, hand up again, or maybe maybe just forgot to put the hand down. No, no, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to talk again. Uh, both Jeff and I attended a grand opening at the, uh, the same, uh, trail opening at Choo Choo, just north of uh, the community, uh, just north of Barrier. And First Journeys work with them also there, and also Patrick Lucas. So I'm familiar with Patrick Lucas and uh, First Journeys. And when I was talking to the uh, coordinator for, um, for the community there, uh, they, they didn't register their, their trails. They, they originally had some funding for some uh, walking trails. And then uh, uh, Patrick Lucas, uh, uh, started working with them and and this fellow he was a already an avid mountain biker and they they started a program of building trails and they got funding but the those trails were not registered and and lately um if if i'm not mistaken is that they because it's on their on their reserve right that they've actually started uh registering some of the trails with a caveat with the government It'd be something for you guys to look into just on this topic uh, that Jeff presented to you because it's an important topic with exactly what we're talking about here. Yeah, beautiful. And um, I can give you a contact uh, email for the, the uh, spot. If you talk to Patrick Lucas, you'll know. Yeah. I'm sure you guys know Patrick. And uh, it, was, it was an amazing day. They they uh, they built it for mountain biking and then uh, the ladies uh, uh, started using it for for hiking and trail running all the trails and uh, everybody's starting to get in shape it was a just incredible story yeah that's awesome. Yeah, go ahead, Sal. Sorry, 
Sorry to add it up again. Oh, no worries. Anyone else have any questions or comments? Yeah, Serge here. Um, excellent presentation. Um, very interesting. Um, yeah, I'm I was just wondering, uh, and, and, and perhaps Leon may know about this, uh, with the Chief Isidore Trail, I wonder if Al Kukus and Neil Shuttleworth that were uh, the main drivers on this, do we know if they ever cleared this through the, the First Nations there, the First Nation, well, First Nations, if, if it's the case or, or not? Or? Uh, from my conversations with uh, Al and Neil, um, it sounded like a lot of the groundwork for collaboration with the Tanaha was done from uh, TCT. Um, so it was, yeah, it was the TCT that kind of moved forth and- oh, um, TCT National, you mean? Yeah, yeah, to incorporate the, the Tanaha with and collaborate with them. Um, so yeah, I, I know that uh, Al and Neil, they put a lot of work into it, but in terms of, um, and, and like a lot of the groundwork and shovels in the ground and, and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, in terms of the uh, developing that relationship with the Tanaha, that was uh, mostly the, the TCT that, that worked on doing that, so. All this pipe in here a bit on the uh, the funding side of it. So there are some big changes happening there. So it looks like the uh, the, the Ministry of Forests and Lands doesn't have a lot of money anymore to use to declining forests and uh, other revenues. So I think going going forward, a lot of the money for trails is going to come from other uh, pots of money, whether it's the Ministry of Transportation or an infrastructure or or, or federally the uh, uh, the, the Ministry of in Infrastructure has already started funding, you know, active transportation. They're actually developing uh, a national uh, infrastructure assessment, which does include active transportation, you know, so there's openings there, uh, you know, they're, they're there as well. And of course, with the new funding sources, one can, can request or strongly recommend, you know, that, you know, uh, that the uh, uh, the approval and endorsement of uh, active transportation trails from the First Nation, you know, would be both sufficient and, in a lot of cases, uh, you know, necessary. So I think those are the areas to uh, to look at and support, uh, you know, going going forward, especially with trails that connect with communities that that do have, uh, you know, recreation, tourism, and cultural component, uh, you know, as well. Oh, and you, oh yeah, yeah and, go ahead, Richard. Yeah, further to that. So the, the provincial government is restructuring the, uh, the ministry. So Nathan Collin is in charge of setting up a new ministry of land. So I suspect that will be really focused on the, the, the First Nations one because it's the right thing to do and they have no other choice, you know, at, at this point. But I think that's also a time for us to uh, engage in that process, uh, support First Nations. And, uh, you know, then also a, a, as appropriate, uh, uh, identify the issues and opportunities for trails with, within the, uh, the context of the working with the First Nations. Awesome, thanks Richard. Um, yeah, uh, any other questions or, or comments? All right, well, um, yeah, I, uh, I guess we can end a little bit early today. Um, I'd just like to thank everyone again for, for coming out. Um, if you have any friends or family or anyone else that's interested, uh, we will be posting uh, the recording of this to YouTube. Uh, and we have a, a, a pretty decent YouTube page now. Um, I'll, just, uh, I'll just put the, the link from our, our channel in the chat right now. 
Um, but yeah, and then I'd also just like to thank the Outdoor Recreation Council of BC um, for funding this event through their micro grant, the Real Estate Foundation of BC, um, and the um, Vancouver Foundation uh, for funding. Um, so there's the, the link to our, our YouTube channel. Um, yeah, th thank you, Aaron, uh, for that um, positive comment. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah, I hope hope everyone is is uh, willing to, to pick up some more resources and, and learn some more and help help fight this this battle because it's a it's a good battle to fight in my opinion and um, yeah the the research again that the, uh, I was a part of was it was foundational no one's really looked at uh, equity related issues and trails um, so it's a huge topic um, and there's a lot more that's coming out of it uh, the BC government, uh, one of their huge mandates is reconciliation. And I know, you know, you never really know, um, especially with everything that's going on with the Ferry Creek. Uh, but um, we, we really hope to make progress in this field and, and to push for reconciliation, and decolonization and trails. So um, presentations like these kind of help lay that groundwork. And if um, you as an or, or if you belong to an organization, uh, it would be awesome if you know you, you helped in this um, and just take into consideration you know some of these factors, some of the things that I brought up, and and how we can work towards um, fostering a more equitable environment in the outdoor recreation and, and tourist sectors. So, thanks everyone again. Um, really appreciate your time.